Ownership of a phone remained a unique feature of Antea's realm, which is why she received an external piece of bad news by word of mouth and then letter. Word of mouth came from a unit of military scouts sent ahead by Empress Helena to ensure safe passage to Castle Obese. Queen Arinia's own scout unit arrived an hour later. Satisfied there were no hidden threats, they left and several hours later two messengers turned up, one from Helena, the other from Irinia, each accompanied by an armed guard and enough flags and banners to suck the townsfolk out of their houses and shops and inns to see the pageant. And they were only the messengers. Antea received them on the drawbridge of the castle. Queen Antea, said one of the messengers from horseback, I have an invitation from the Empress Helena, High Majesty of Bavaria, Franconia and Bohemia, Protector of Austria and the Magyar. Yes, I know who she is. Antea beckoned the other messenger. I too have an invitation from Queen Irenia. Is it the same invitation? They weren't sure. Both messengers drew the horses together and read the messages. It seems they are, said Helena's messenger, who wore more metal in his armour than Irenia's messenger, whose leather armour was elaborately embossed with birds and fishes. What is the invitation? Antea's presence on the drawbridge was humbling, backed by three warrior scholars on foot, and forced to look up at messengers who were so much lower down the social scale. The remaining scholars on the battlements hadn't bothered to unfurl so much as a handkerchief. The Empress Helena has formed a territorial alliance with Queen Irinia. Together, they control great swathes of Central Europe, major waterways and strategic towns and cities. They now invite you to join their alliance to fill the gap that your realm currently occupies. I see. Do you want a decision now? No. The Empress Helena and Queen Irinia will arrive the day after tomorrow. They ask that you consider the offer and give them your response during the visit. A visit at my expense, I presume. Would you have them stay in the local tavern? And why not? It's warmer than the castle. I will relay your refusal to accommodate the Emperor. I'm not refusing to accommodate her. Don't be so touchy. Of course I'll accommodate her. I'm Queen Irinia. No doubt their entire entourage. According to Irinia's messenger, the total entourage would come to about 200 people. And when the messengers left, Antea went back inside to be told there was only enough food to feed her own entourage for the next four days. Oh, great. This alliance invitation isn't a big enough problem. Antea had a throne room with a throne, but she rarely used it, except when she wanted to be alone. The throne room reminded her of ancestry and heritage, and it reminded her of her parents, the legacy they left, the gifts she never wanted. The anthologist knew he was in a bad books, but he also knew he was one of the few people to whom she would reveal her deepest concerns. He kept silent, waiting for her to choose the moment to speak. Close the door, she said, and slumped into the throne, letting her arms dangle either side of it. I hate politics. I hate alliances and strategies and always looking over my shoulder. I love this castle. I love this town and this lake and this valley, but I hate the world they occupy. She sighed and dragged her fingers through her straggly dark hair. Look at me. Dress like you. Can't sit in a chair properly because of this sword. And everyone I know has either terrified me or licks the ground I walk on. She acknowledged him for the first time. Except you, of course. I don't know whether that's because you're very brave or very stupid. Do you have laryngitis? No. Well, say something. Cautiously, he stepped towards the throne, fully aware of her suspicions. I'm no politician myself, Majesty. She waved her arm. Don't. You don't need to call me that. Sorry. I was in a bad mood. Call me Antea again. 
makes me feel human. And tell you, I'm not a politician or a legal expert. Could you not declare your realm neutral territory? Don't join the alliance, but don't oppose it either. Yes, no, I don't know. That's a short-term measure, isn't it? It's everything. I always knew my life was precarious, but the assassin's letter came as a shock. And maybe I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was. But look what you did. You outwitted her. You turned it into an asset, and without even raising your sword. You can win battles without fighting. You're intelligent enough to do that. You can counter these two. Stick my reputation on it. I'm flattered, but you don't have a reputation. Sit down. She invited him to sit on the throne of the consort. There won't be a war. I have soldiers I can call on. There are families out there who would stand by me. And Helena and Irinia both know the size of their armies are unwieldy. Any number of them could be turncoats. It would be a bloodbath. No one would win. To them this would be a matter of honour. Succeeding would bolster their popularity. But why do they want an alliance now? What's the, what's the threat forcing them to consolidate? Who knows? And Taya's position in the throne was growing more and more horizontal. If she had a stool, she would have put her feet on it. But it's one more aggravation, one more inconvenience. I'm stopping you from doing what? Travelling. I want to do what you do, travel, explore, make discoveries, see the world beyond these valleys. I'm very proud of the library here. I spend enough time in it. Well, that's good, that's a good thing. Can I make a suggestion? No, he was chancing his arm and talking off the top of his head. And Taya didn't move, but rolled her eyes left to study him. What? Travel. Leave Linnaeus in charge. I'll take care of the library. She can take care of your realm. If she parks her ship over the castle towers, no one will dare come near. The toes of Antea's boots tapped together. That's a more appealing idea than an alliance. She leapt out of the throne. Let me consider it. Thank you. She stopped and turned back to him. The sight of the anthologist in the consort's throne pulled her up sharply. Seriously, thank you. I'm sorry I suspected you, you know. I don't apologise for it, I understand. Good. And don't get too comfortable in that throne. I was thinking of throwing it out. She didn't walk, she marched. Whatever her mood, Antea took long strides and she was out of the throne room in seconds, leaving the doors open as a signal that it was time for him to leave too. The visitation of the messengers was a brief distraction compared to the ground-trembling arrival of the Empress Helena, High Majesty of Bavaria, Franconia and Bohemia, Protector of Austria and the Magyar territories, Queen Arania of somewhere else. A cloud of black flags with gold cross keys and red scorpions announced the entourage. Arania's black and white cross brought up the rear. From the battlements, the anthologists stood alongside Maya and Anthea and Evelyn and Ambria and watched the ground change colour. They're not all going to try and get in here. Ambria sniffed and rubbed her nose with an armoured gauntlet. They'll camp by the lake. The castle's only just big enough for Helena's ego and her ambitions. At the table, in a suite of offices cleared out for the event, Helena prodded and pointed at several maps. Irinia used a riding crop to demonstrate new boundaries, trade routes, defensive lines and safe havens. What's all this for? said Antea. What threat are you countering? Threat? Helena and Irinia spoke together. Irinia's grin always reminded Antea of a blood orange opening up and revealing the inside to be full of teeth. There's no threat. We're not digging in, we're consolidating as an outward show of force to deter anyone out there in the direction of the whip who may have ideas to come and conquer us. Helena couldn't take her eyes off the map. It's a message, a statement that we intend to remain rulers of our land and anyone who thinks otherwise will suffer for it. 
Do you have an answer to our invitation, Antea? She had long enough to think about it, and when the moment came, she had the anthologist and Guinevere alongside her. I need persuading. I know you're not going to force me to join. That would be catastrophic for everyone. So if I say no, what then? This was not the answer they were anticipating. Helena's frustration pulled her into a chair. Why? It strengthens your position, Ante. We come to your aid in times of trouble, you come to ours. Exactly. It's a little one-sided. I have the smallest army. How do I know you'll come to my aid? You might be away, invading the Baltics when I need help. We'll sign a treaty. Irenaeus' grin was no reassurance. You're so predictable, said Elena. So predictable, we came here with a contingency plan. Really? Antea found herself alone at the table with her adversaries when everyone else retreated to the walls. A challenge, said Irenia. Just the three of us. The outright winner decides on the alliance. There's three of us, which means one of us must win two of the challenges. What challenges? Like three chess players, they sat on their own side of the table, with Antea, the only one in the dark. Helena explained, A test of accuracy, an archery contest. I know you're a fine archer, Antea. You stand a good chance of winning. And a test of courage, said Irenia, a joust. I believe you are trained by one of the finest horseback warriors on the continent, Hilda of Brandenburg. She works with me, yes. And the third challenge? A test of memory, said Elena. And you can choose that challenge. A challenge that involves this wonderful library of yours. She glanced at the anthologist, and the whole reason for the visit in the Alliance began to point towards the existence of one particular book in the castle library. Well, if that's what you want, Antea anchored herself to the table and breathed in. Archery tomorrow, the joust the day after and the final day of the memory test. It all sounded like a good idea. When Helena and Irinia were gone, Guinevere and the anthologist joined Antea at the window. I'd be wrong to assume this is going to be a three-point victory to you, said Guinevere. The mid-afternoon sun flashed off Helena's armour when she crossed the courtyard to a private suite of rooms on the north side of the castle. She is a very good archer. She makes me look like a clown. And the other one, Irinia strolled amongst her advisers and guards, all of them like lost shadows, looking for something solid to follow. Have you ever seen Irinia joust? I have. I've never seen her miss an opponent. In that case, you need a good memory test and there'll be a tie. The anthologist received a pat on the shoulder for his suggestion. I'll let you sort that one out then. Guinevere, help me find my suit of armour. I'm not even sure I still have one. The suit of armour was found in a room in one of the towers. Some of the joints were rusty, and the last time Antea wore it, she must have been almost a metre shorter than she was now. If someone can adjust it today in time for tomorrow, some embellishment, some kind of eagle or lion or something with sharp teeth, they can't go into a joust looking like a yeoman. On the archery field, in front of a large, eager crowd, the three noble women lined up for the first contest. The targets were set at a range of 100 metres, Helena's bow was handcrafted specifically for her exact measurements. Draw strength, draw length, arrow length. Every arrow flight had her cross keys and scorpion emblem, a leather quiver embossed to match her leather armband. And with an outfit designed for maximum comfort, finished off with long thigh boots, she distracted her opponents before a shot was fired. Helena's accuracy left her arrows in an intimate cluster in the dead centre of the target. Irinia, who knew there was no point competing, peppered her target with enough confidence to win any other contest not involving Helena. But she was pushed into third place by Antea, whose long days of practice in all weathers delivered a respectable score. Two points behind. Helena shook Antea's hand. A good contest. 
Perhaps a stronger wind blowing across a field would have evened things up. Oh, I doubt it. And Taylor's mind was on the anthologist and his secret preparations for a memory test. Congratulations, said Irenia. She knew her moment was lying in wait. The others knew it too, and neither Antea nor Helena slept that night. The morning after, before the jousting preparations began, Antea asked the anthologist what he had come up with. He grimaced. Obviously it can't be something that might look as if you have an unfair advantage. Find the Bible, guess how many steps run up the east turret. I'm still working on it. His great idea, as he called it, was finalised when Antea came plodding out of the stables, weighted down by a suit of armour, half of which was adorned with gold panels and a plume of swan feathers in the helmet. The anthologist forgot his words, and for the first time he considered Antea not to be his employer, but his queen. This is not the real me, she said, adjusting a cuirass in grave with two identical ram's heads, with sinister faces and long horns, curling backwards to follow the contours of the chest. For all the protection it offers from Irenia, it might as well be made from alabaster. She winced when Hilda lifted her right arm to tighten the belts. I've lost round one, I'll lose round two. If you two don't have the answer for round three, librarian, we'll all be living in caves this time next week. I know the real you is in there somewhere, said the anthologist. And Taya's coaters and pauldrons were decorated with four pairs of small angel's wings. An unfortunate reference to where she was going if the joust went horribly wrong. When he told her his idea for round three, she dropped the helmet. A maze? Yes. The three of you go in, the first one to come out wins. Where is this maze? Filled with a sudden sense of servitude, he was reluctant to question her lack of territorial knowledge. It's on the southwest corner of the gardens, Majesty. Nantea. Sorry. Stuck for words, she left Hilda to retrieve the helmet, and they walked away discussing tactics and how to avoid being impaled on Arrhenius' lance. The result of the jousting was a foregone conclusion, and not wanting to suffer for longer than necessary, Helena opted to joust first against Irinia, whose war horse could have stepped the length of the arena with half a dozen strides. The crowd loved it, entranced by Irinia's colossal presence, made all the more disturbing by the dull and gloss of her black armour, a silver exoskeleton deliberately darkened by a royal blacksmith and a woodland supply of charcoal. In contrast, Helena preferred to be seen, which was probably a mistake in a contest where she was the target and when her horse thundered across the sodden ground the result of the challenge almost came second to Helena ending up face first in the mud. The first pass and Arrhenia's lance glanced off Helena's shoulder. She wobbled and swayed, grabbed her horse's neck and survived the bumping of a vigorous trot when the horse slowed to come back. The second pass was more accurate but still left Helena in the saddle, lurching to hang on. Irinia tried to turn her head, but had to wait until she stopped, just in time to see Helena slide out of her saddle and land in a pool of mud. What do you suggest? said Antea. Hilda surveyed the field and the muddy outline of Helena being reintroduced to her horse by several aides. She ducked down behind the horse's neck. Which means she'll have limited vision and a split second to direct her lance. You need to aim for the horse, between the eyes. I can't kill a horse. You won't kill it. The speed of reaction means you'll just miss it and hit the Empress. If you aim for her, you'll miss. Right. Aim for the horse. Aim for the horse. Aim for the horse. Hilda helped Antea to mount and gave her one final piece of advice. Look the horse in the eyes. The lance will go where you're looking. She followed the instruction to the letter, made no effort to hide herself, even though her horse had a neck as wide as a cathedral door. She watched Helena accelerate, the muddy rider lowering herself as the horses came together. Antea lowered her lance, caught the large brown eye of the opposing horse, and waited. 
The impact almost knocked her off her own horse. Helena flew like a kite, arms flailing, legs higher than her head. She came down in a second pool of mud, sending up an exuberant splash and bringing the crowd to their feet. And Tay was on home soil. She had the people behind her and they roared, they roared for their queen. Irinia loved the challenge and the opportunity to fight someone who was her equal. That was a shot I'd be proud of. There was a possibility the helmet was designed to accommodate that smile. I'm sure you won't be so easy to hit, said Antea, catching her breath. Don't belittle yourself. Helena has a good riding position, eye contact. Irinia really knew. That's how it works. I'd make sure you keep Hilda at court. A teacher like that would command her own salary. The joust that would decide the outcome was held during a break in the cloud, but the strong sunlight made no difference to Irinia's black armour. Antea had to decide whether to play defensive, avoid Irinia's speed and accuracy, or throw away any sense of caution and go for the eyes again. If she lost, the pressure would be on the memory challenge and the half-baked idea involving a maze she didn't know she had. Where is this maze? said Hilda as Antea headed for the arena. It's in the garden somewhere. The yew hedge. I always thought it was a boundary. Well, apparently there's a maze behind it. Wish me luck. Be positive, Majesty. Be positive, yes. I just hope I don't land in the mud. The threat of injury didn't worry her. The worry was defeat. How the townsfolk would react to seeing their queen weakened. Entering the arena in a suit of half golden armour and leaving it encased in tough. The mountains grew in height. The eager sun closed its eye and in the gathering gloom, Irinia's faceless black obstacle stood to attention. The smile gone, the lance primed, the war horse stomping its hoof. He was the one looking into Antea's eyes. The charge began. The horses maddened by combat. Irinia remained upright. Antea lowered her centre of gravity, kept her focus locked on the horse's eyes and aimed the lance. She saw nothing else other than Irinia closing in. The gallop took forever until suddenly Irinia was on her. She felt the punch, a tremendous singularity, straight into the centre of her cuirass. Her own horse carried on without a flinch, leaving Antea suspended with her boots entering a line of vision, her armoured knees following them. The crowd inverted and the mountain peaks pointed downwards, changing places with the hanging valleys. There was no sympathy in the way the ground welcomed her. The momentum flung her like a metallic ball, turning and pitching the clatter of metal, pauldrons and cusses, urban and scattered in all directions. Her legs refusing to stop and dragging her torso in an endless loop, she bounced like a rock, flew like a fallen tree and eventually battered the arena wall, came to rest, if rest was the right word, with her shoulders buried in the soil, her ankles skyward and a small group of puzzled faces staring down at her. A young boy obediently fetched her detached helmet and offered it to her. You've burst your nose, he said. A hurried group of new faces fussed and snatched the helmet. They were unrecognisable for a moment until the strong hands of Hilda ushered them apart. Don't move her. Majesty, can you feel your toes? Yes, she said, drowsily pointing at her feet. You mean those toes? Those toes, yes. Look at my finger. And Taya blinked, certain Hilda only used a singular and she held up several index fingers. She's concussed. Leave her a moment. According to the anthologist, Antea was only out for five minutes, but when she came round, she was determined to ban ice cream, even though no one knew what ice cream was. She was taken to the castle infirmary, carried on a hazel hurdle by six warrior scholars. I take it she was announced the winner. Antea sipped a large tankard of brandy. The anthologist stood next to the bed and examined various bits and pieces of shattered armour in his hands. 
It was a pretty conclusive victory. This arm is very good, you know. We all thought a blow like that should have gone right through you. It felt like it did. She wheezed when she breathed in. Oh, I hope I never fall down the stairs. I, mean, I hate to raise the subject, but it does mean you have to win the memory challenge now. Oh, don't remind me. We found the designer. Designer? Of the maze. He still lives in the town and plays the fiddle. He's going to give you all a plan of the maze and one hour to memorise it. Did they carry out my instruction? Instruction? To ban ice cream? The anthologist dropped the armour on the foot of the bed and called for Antea's nurse. The memory challenge caused a rumpus before anyone had gone near the entrance. 24 hours after being jabbed off her horse at high speed, Antea was still feeling groggy and wanted to take an assistant into the maze. The same applies to everyone. We can all take one helper. You'll take the librarian, said Helena, who had tried to disguise a bruise creeping from collarbone to jaw. I don't trust him. Neither do I, said Arinia, fresh as a flower and grinning again. You two chose the other challenges. You can take who you want. And Taylor's obvious inability to walk without a limp persuaded the others to relent. And when the maze designer arrived with the plans, Irinia had chosen a guard as tall as a pine tree, whilst Helena had asked her code breaker to help. One hour, said the maze designer. In spite of great age, he skipped and flitted like a man desperate to get out of his own maze. Fiddle in hand, he distributed three plans and left shouting, One hour! I'll be on my fiddle-beating time and then I'll be back. Be ready. And Taya sat at the table and rolled the plan and shoved it in front of the anthologist. But I'm the helper then. And this whole thing was your idea. Well, that doesn't mean I have a great memory. Text, yes, but patterns. Well, all is lost. In fact, she had that accusatory expression again. Who were you expecting to win? Well, hang on. Do you think I've arranged all this so that Helena can win? Irinia might win. Well, thanks for your confidence. The sound of a fiddle seeped through the open window. Get memorising. One hour later, the only person fiddling was the anthologist. Fiddling with his coat sleeves, his pockets, his collar. The competitors gathered at the entrance to the maze where its designer welcomed the challengers. Remember the maze is not an arbitrary pattern. Having studied the plan, you should by now be familiar with the code. The word code pleased Helena and cast a frown across Antea's expression. No one mentioned a code, she whispered to the anthologist. You each have a helper, said the maze designer. Are you all ready? Yes, said Helena. Of course, said Irinia. And Taya was distracted by a small girl who had pushed through the legs of the crowd and stood gesturing to a queen. What is it? Please, Majesty, may I be your helper? Uh, why would you want to be my helper? She shrugged and stirred at her feet, and then, with a wave of her tiny hand, beckoned her queen to come close. What is it, Lieber? Antea placed her ear to the girl's mouth to listen to her secret. Antea stood up. My new helper. The crowd gasped. Helena twisted her head in suspicion and Arinia scratched her chin. Shall we start? said Antea. Please! The maze designer held his fiddle. Let the contest begin! Irinia was the first to enter the maze and found herself descending two steep steps onto a grass path, the drop in height leaving her tall guard useless. Helena ignored the fiddle and the jaunty music followed Irinia. Antea moved to go next, but the girl pulled her back. Wait a few seconds, Majesty. She turned her head to the sound of the fiddle and waited. The anthologist shared the crowd's bemusement, and then without signal the girl stepped into the maze, hand in hand with her queen. Who is she? said the anthologist to Guinevere. Queen Antea, don't you know anything? 
In the wait for a victor to emerge, several members of the crowd danced to the fiddle music and the anthologist found a place to sit on a grassy bank. The central timber tower indicated the middle of the maze and from there a bridge carried the successful out of the maze without the need to negotiate any more turns and junctions. Until someone appeared at the tower, there was no way to judge progress or who might be getting close, but eventually a head appeared on the steps leading to the tower and Taya's head. Once in the tower, she lifted the girl up to look back across the puzzle they had conquered. The girl raised her fists and cheered along with the queen in an ecstatic crowd. When she emerged from the bridge and the exit, she was met by a woman who introduced herself as the girl's mother. She is a wonder, said Antea. You should be immensely proud of your daughter. I am a little surprised, but proud all the same. Haven't I seen you before? You play in the castle quartet, don't you? The violin? I do, Majesty. The anthologist joined the celebration with a crowd had surrounded the girl, her mother and Antea. The maze designer had to fight his way through the pack. Congratulations, he said. A worthy competitor. And now would you like to share with us how you did it? The girl laughed, too modest to explain, but prompted by her mother, she revealed the code. When the fiddler plays his music, a rising note means turn right, a descending note, turn left. The intervals determine which entrance to choose. One whole interval, next turn. Two whole intervals, skip the next turn. And half interval means continue straight on at the crossroads. The explanation forced the crowd to erupt and they clapped with enormous excitement. But then Antea hushed them. Holding a finger to her mouth, she pointed at the yew hedge. Someone still trapped and fighting to get out was on the other side listening. Without a word, Antea took the maze designer's violin, handed it to the girl's mother and whispered, play something, anything, but make it complicated. The girl's mother knew the perfect piece and played on as the crowd celebrated. The challenge is tied, the realm safe for now, but even so, even so, said the anthologist, watching Antea attack a side of beef. There'll be no more calls for an alliance, she said. No more calls for anything. The cooking meat and fire pits masked the smell of a distant blaze that only became apparent when the smoke crossed the fields of the pageant and the burning maze alerted a tremendous panic. Antea remained at her outdoor dinner table and watched Helene's entourage scurry to the lake for water. Irinia's guards are them. They're not still in there, are they? said the anthologist, standing on his chair. Go and find out, I don't know. Every challenge comes with risk, even memory challenges. She washed down the beef with a satisfying mouthful of wine. If they got out, they'll be fine. If not, she raised a glass to Guinevere. To the future. To the future, Majesty, said Guinevere.